John, I love reading about the origins of the universe, understand how it all came about. Uh, and a lot of the hot stuff focuses, uh, pardon the pun, on, on what happened in the first three minutes or 10 to the minus 36 of, of for the mm -hmm. first second. Uh, but what about the structure thereafter? Uh, you, a lot of the work you're doing is on galactic structure and formation and evolution. What, what does that tell us about what we see today and where we go in the future? Yeah, thinking about the future is interesting because um, there's a lot of it out there. Okay. As, as far as we can tell, the, the expansion of the universe is now launched on a phase that we call the sitter space. It just means the size of the scale factor just increases exponentially with time. But that goes on forever. I mean, when you say forever, you know, it's the, that the, since the apparent Big Bang, uh, that is the end of inflation, the, um, we're now, what, 13, 14 billion years in. But you know, as far as we know, things will look much like they do now, just with a rather heavily diluted matter content in 14 trillion, 14,000 trillion, you know, mm -hmm. pick a number. Of course, we don't, infinity is a, a long time. We can't go on forever, because this is assuming that the cosmological constant is exactly that. And as I said before, we only know that every time the universe exponentiates by one e-folding, it might change by a few percent. So you stack that up over trillions of years, of course, we could live in a completely different vacuum than the one we do now. So we can only kind of speculate maybe, you know, the, the, the next hundred billion years or, mm -hmm. or, or so, <laughs> only. Mm. Um, but it's interesting to, to me, from the point of view of the observer selection argument, to think about how that would go. Because Weinberg's original approach to this was to say, well, look, most stars in the universe at present are in galaxies like our own Milky Way. And anthropically, then, it's not so surprising that we indeed live in the Milky Way rather than some tiddly little dwarf galaxy. Yeah. And it's certainly true that if the cosmological constant was much larger than it is, we wouldn't be forming many Milky Ways. Okay, so that's the guts of the observer selection argument. No Milky Ways, no stars, no observers. But what interests me is, is whether, nevertheless, star formation could take place in different galaxies, given enough time. So at the moment, dwarf galaxies, of, of which there are vastly more than the Milky Way, in terms of total mass, never mind total number, oh. um, haven't yet formed stars in great numbers. We've got plenty of, of, of time ahead. So because there's so many dwarf galaxies, if they all form stars with the efficiency that the Milky Way has, eventually, then there'll be many more stars in the mm. universe other than in, in, the, in the Milky Way. And then Weinberg's argument would, would fail because we could tolerate a larger cosmological constant because we don't need Milky Ways. Oh. Right? And that's, that interests me because this would be an example of a multiverse argument that, that could be falsifiable science because we might predict that the upper tolerance of the cosmological constant was 10,000 times its present value, in which case I wouldn't believe an observer selection is a good explanation of oh. the number. So this, this, this remains to be seen. What type of time frame are you talking about for the generation of stars in these dwarf galaxies? Well, I, I don't care. Anything beyond the, the, the point is it's not enough just to ask how far have we got in 14 billion years. Sure. We need to keep going until we've gone far enough into the future that we're pretty sure things have converged. And of course, that's hard to demonstrate because even a tiny dribble of star formation over a trillion years is, <laughs> is a lot. Right, so this is quite a challenging an uncertain calculation. Um, but but is, is that feasible, that over trillions of years you'll continue to have star formation as the universe continues to expand if, in an accelerating fashion due to yeah, dark energy? It, in principle, the, the key question right, is, is getting the gas into the galaxies. Because at the moment, oh, yeah. in some sense, galaxies are nearby to each other. Um, and they're bound structures. And as we discussed, they don't care about the cosmological constant. In, in, you know, the, 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 they'll never expand, but they'll, the cosmological constant will push them apart. So eventually, they'll be extremely widely separated. Right. And then the question is, any gas that's very far from any galaxy will be without a home to go to forever. Right. Mm -hmm. But any gas that's in the far periphery of a galaxy can be drawn in. Can eventually be drawn in. You know, once it's bound to the galaxy, it'll get to the center eventually. Mm. You know, it can be hot gas that's very diffuse takes a long time to radiate away its energy, cool in the, in the astronomical jargon. Mm. But once it's bound to a galaxy, we've got all the time in the world, and then I think any gas, gas that's bound 
will form stars eventually. So, what we're so the key thing is to figure out what happens to the diffuse gas between the galaxies, and that's something that people haven't given a lot of attention to. And, and whether it, it, it can be bound to yeah. one of them, even no matter how far away, what, what, how far away is bound? Yeah, exactly. So These example, are the sort of things you have to think about. So if we have between Milky Way and Andromeda, is, is uh, a, 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 a million, two million light years or something? It's one megaparsec, pretty well, like, so exactly. Three. So that's three, three. three light years. Three, three, so three, three light years. So arguably, I'm, I'm just to see where would the gas yeah. potentially be bound to one or the other, right. and where would it be well, uh, that, uh, that's often? That's easy, easy to answer in that case, because in fact we now know that Milky Way and Andromeda are, are indeed bound to each other. Oh, so right. then so, it's all, so it's in the all far bad. future, they're going to collapse right. anyway, and merge into so some you're larger all galaxy. The gas in between. So certainly, as far as the you know, Milky Way will get everything as far as Andromeda, oh, okay. or Andromeda will get everything okay. as far as the Milky Way, because okay. okay. it's a bit bigger than we are. Okay. So now you have to draw a sphere around them a, a and say sphere. collectively that that mega group. Right. How far out? Yeah, well, how much gas is in the vicinity of, of that? Right. And what, what's its future? And, and how you can be yeah. bound. Now, and, for, the, for the Milky Way. This isn't so important because the Milky Way and Andromeda have already been pretty efficient at forming stars. Right. It's the corresponding question for lower mass systems that, that's interesting to me to explore. I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of the order of magnitude of years and, and trillion of year, years or however that, that it, it, if as this process develops that the smaller galaxies will be able to draw in the gas that is bound to them. Uh, w what's the rough time frame, rough order of magnitude? Well, it's I mean, it's very hard to say because the cooling time gets. If it was easy, I, I would. The cooling time, asked. yeah, the cooling time gets longer as, as as you go to the outside. I mean, it can easily be. I mean, the simulation. I can tell you certainly the simulations that, that we've run. There's there's gas, which has a cooling time of um, uh, at least. Uh, at least a hundred billion years, I think, is the, okay. the longest cooling gas that we've seen. Okay. And it has to cool so that it loses its, its own energy and gravity can... can, can yeah, uh, exactly. As the internal energy is radiated away, in yeah. principle, it can, be, it can fall in under gravity. There's yeah, nothing great. to prevent it then. Great. Uh, and, and so, to the far future, as you look to it, what, what is the ultimate structure? Is the ultimate structure bound groups yeah. in a, in a yeah. virtually infinite... Uh, well, the, except they, they, they won't really be groups because... Of, Oh, no, yeah, There'll yeah, be, yeah. be groups like Andromeda yeah. and the Milky Way, they but eventually they, they'll merge. They were groups. So, that, so they'll, those groups will turn into single mega yeah. galaxies. Right, right, right. And then increasingly, the distance, the next mega galaxy, will eventually, that'll be effectively beyond our horizon. So it's, it will lose causal contact. And this is already happening, actually. I mean, the funny thing is that you, you look at some of these beautiful Hubble Space Telescope pictures, you see the sky is littered with faint galaxies. Yeah. The majority of those are already, in some sense, receding far, faster than light. As we're getting the light now that they emitted in the past, but we'll never get the light that they're, they're emitting today. Yeah. And that sphere of cutoff is going to come closer and closer to us as the universe becomes more lambda dominated. So, in the far future, the night sky well, it might look, it'll eventually look really boring because eventually the stars in, in one of these galaxies will die out, of course. And we can't then look at the night sky and see stars, and there's for sure no... In principle, there'll still be galaxies up there, but exponentially faint, just like these faint um, mm. Hubble Space Telescope galaxies. So there'll be no stimulus to do astronomy. It's, you know, we're very lucky. Well, I'm glad to be living now rather than uh, at some other time. Hmm?